Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 139 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the Five Minute Medievalist. The medieval period seems to be commonly known as a time when people rejected science and technology, when they were somehow fearful of trying new things. In part, this is based on propaganda from later eras because making the past look bad automatically makes the present look good. But in part, this is also because there are some things we're so used to that we've stopped thinking of them as technology. Things like books, buttons, eyeglasses, and paper. This week, I invited Dr. Orietta Darold to speak with me about the rise of paper in medieval Europe. Orietta is an associate professor at Cambridge University, a fellow at St. John's College, and a member of the Center for Material Texts. Her work focuses on materiality and manuscripts, so not just what's in books, but what books are. She's contributed to and edited many books on medieval manuscripts and literature, and is the author of a new book, Paper in Medieval England, From Pulp to Fictions. Here's our conversation on medieval paper, how it was made, who made it, and its many uses beyond just making books. Well, thank you, Orietta, for coming to talk to us about paper. I'm really excited about this because I love the small things about daily life. So thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. It's a great book, and I'm sure people are going to learn so much from the book and from this interview. So let's start at the beginning, and that is, how is paper made? How is paper made in the Middle Ages? How do you make it? (laughs) Yeah, well, paper was made from rugs. So it's a very somehow simple material to be made, because all what you need, you need old rugs, possibly from linen. So linen rugs rather than cotton rugs. And they were all mashed down that they would become a pulp. And then with that pulp, they would make paper. So they would make paper with this square mold that would go into a vat, shifting around, making a sheet, and then off with the next one. So the process in itself is very easy and straightforward, but as all technologies, nothing is so easy and straightforward. (laughs) So it took a little bit of time, I think, to perfect the technology. I mean, this is also something I talk about in the book, in which I explain that paper didn't just materialize as the nice paper we can see in some early printed books, for example. Mm -hmm. It took a little bit of time to make paper at that sort of quality. I like that perspective where you're zooming out and looking at it as a new technology, because I like the idea of someone saying to each other, have you tried paper? (laughs) And that's what it must have been like at some point, right? Absolutely. That's absolutely spot on. Because So the other material of choice for writing in the Middle Ages was parchment, which was animal skin. Now, can you imagine wrapping fish in parchment? (laughs) No, not at all. So what perhaps we ought to imagine is that some situations that happens today, when we talk to each other, when we advise each other, when we want to suggest new avenues, might have exactly happened in the Middle Ages. So paper, which actually was made of textile and textile was used for wrapping. The next passage was, "Mm, with what do I wrap this? Oh, I haven't tried old paper. In Milan, for example, there were these people who were wrapping salami in paper. You know, old accounts, not important anymore although for us now they are really important and we wish they had not been used to wrap salami but um you know it's it's really this sort of dynamic which makes actually the middle ages not a dark age at all Mm -hmm. (laughs) it is an exciting age Mm -hmm. so we know that paper made its way from china when did it start to appear in europe that people started to use it or talk to each other and say, have you tried paper? It's great for wrapping salami. (laughs) Yeah, I I don't think we have an exact date, but I think 11th century, really, we we do have the first document. In the Western known Arabic part of Europe, you know, I just want to be a little bit careful about this because of course there is also all the Islamic part that is, you know, North Africa up, to the Spanish Peninsula, and I think that there was the use of paper much earlier. That's not an area of my expertise, so I don't want to start advancing possibilities of chronology there. But I think around yeah, 11th century, paper started to be used. 
Um, right. I have some early record in Sicily around that time. Right. And that brings me to my next question, which is, who is making paper? If we're sticking to Europe and England is your specialty when mm -hmm. it comes to paper, who is making it? Was it just everyday people who were making their own paper in the backyard or <laughs> who was making it? So paper in England was imported. So there was no real paper mill, people making paper on the ground until the end of the 15th century. And the paper, the imported paper was mainly Italian. So there were paper made mainly, well, we know it was made because of the tracing of a special symbol that we find on paper called watermark. We know that it came from Fabriano. We also know it came from Pioraco. And, and in general, we know from merchants' documentations that one of the best paper that medieval people could get hold on was, in fact, paper from Pioraco and Fabriano. Although in Italy at that time, they were making paper also elsewhere. So Genoa, Bologna, up to Venice. But the point is not necessarily about who made paper and where paper was made, but is who had the connections to get the paper shipped over to England, if that makes sense. <laughs> yes, that makes sense. <laughs> so why were the Italians the ones to get paper shipped to England? Oh, because they just were some of the entrepreneurs. So we do know, so in the 12th century, Italian merchants 12th into 13th century, really started to move out of that comfort zone. And also they started to become pop bankers. So they were actually sent around Europe to collect the taxes for the pop. And of course, as they were doing that, they could also do a little bit of commerce so they would start setting up bases around Europe, and England was one of them. Edward I was a king who relied immensely on Italian merchants to finance all of his wars and campaigns. And therefore then, you know, when you start getting money into borrowing, then you have the connection, then you start getting the galleys in and the galleys shouldn't just come in full of one item. They can come in full of a lot of things. And hey, there's lo some lovely Italian paper. Why don't you bring in some for me? Thank you very much. And the importation records show that they did bring in paper. So uh, the importation records from the end of the 14th century are actually quite interesting because they do talk about paper in different sizes, in different quantities. So that's quite interesting. And the Italians in their business dealings, because they're doing business everywhere, they just get everywhere <laughs> in the Middle Ages. They're using paper a lot for receipts and correspondence, right? Is, do you think that's how it got introduced more broadly yeah. was being used as receipts? Yeah, I, because you see that uh, um, receipts, letters, registers, but also checks. Oh, so, see, I didn't realize that. Tell us yeah, about checks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, for example, or, or payment order, which are our old-fashioned checks. Mm -hmm. You know, um, because they decided not to move the capital around. I mean, this is a little, perhaps, easy way of explaining it. But instead of moving the capital around and the money around they decided to tell people to draw money out of different branches. So they would say, oh, you can go and get X amount of money from the London branch. So somebody would turn up with this piece of paper that said, oh, give me 500 pounds or anything else. So it's, it's really, effectively, they created the beginning of the modern banking system that now relies on electronic transactions but then relied on paper transactions. Of course, paper then is also not very heavy. It was easily available. It becomes the sort of items that everybody has and everybody wants. But you are absolutely right. You know, one of the very first records, for example, that I found in England of people using paper, one of the records that I identify at the end of the 14th century talks about receipts and 
registers written on paper that were brought into the exchequer from the Riccardi merchants in Lucca. And that's the scribe who wrote this down, wrote on paper. I think he was a bit surprised to see because he doesn't write records on parchment. He just writes them on paper. And so that's really the, the, the extraordinary. So it's all, it's all about interconnection and relation, really. You know, I see something, some people might say, oh, I want it, or some other people might say it's useful, and then it ends up everywhere else. I like the moments that you have in the book where you spot where there's a transition between parchment to paper mm -hmm. or they're being used together. Like there are some examples that you have where there are records where people have written everything on paper, but they're not sure the paper is going to be strong enough to last. So they sew it onto some parchment <laughs> and they keep that as a record. Why do you think this works together? And another thing you say in the book is that paper and parchment are not in competition. So how mm -hmm. do you see them working together? Well, for, for these sort of reasons, because there is the perception of the property of a material. So the perception as there is our perception. We quite often like to think parchment is stronger, is higher grade, is for nicer books. And therefore, then we end up talking about status. And I always like to resist that temptation because indeed there would be people who thought, oh, I want this book on parchment, beautiful white parchment, because it has a meaning beyond the book itself. But at the same time, when you find an example like the one you have described, you know, with paper and parchment being backed up one with, with the other, I mean, that paper came from the secretariat of Richard II. So it came from the king. So in that case, the king had elected to send his correspondences on paper. But the people who received it at the other end thought, hmm, you know, this is legal stuff. We cannot afford it to go up in flame or to, we, we need to make sure that it lasts. And so they put the parchment onto it. They could have copied it out. I mean, this is the bit that to me is really puzzling. They could have copied it out. So to keep it as a copied record, but instead they backed it up. So again, you know, what I'm wondering is, what is there when we talk about technologies that work with each other? Mm -hmm. So think, think about it, you know, we always like to think about all the death of the book and the digital is taking over. You know, there is always this grand narrative about media and technologies. And I'm actually thinking that they are human. Mm -hmm. Not that technologies are human, but <laughs> they are being used by humans. And I try to get out of the technology the most that I can get, mm -hmm. rather than thinking, oh, one is the demon and the other one is the savior. It, it, <laughs> I think it's this sort of narrative that I was trying to move away from in the book, because I think if we move away from that narrative, then we can really enjoy the greatest moment and the stories, actually, that paper can tell us beyond this sort of to way of looking at the material. Yeah, exactly. Well, this has reminded me of a whole bunch of things when we're talking about getting correspondence from the king on paper and thinking, well, maybe I need to back this up. It reminds me of when people first started getting emails, maybe this dates me too much, and they had to print their print their emails off, right? Because <laughs> you needed a second copy. <laughs> it's that same like technological bridge where you don't need to print your emails, but you feel like you need to print your emails just in case. <laughs> Absolutely right. Or the fact that, and this is a, perhaps a slightly different example, that we need to delete the emails now because we don't want to have electronic <laughs> copies of things that we shouldn't keep. Yeah. Or, or, or sometimes we delete emails and then we can't find them. And we go like, oh, I lost all of this information. <laughs> it, it, is, it is quite interesting, this idea of loss and keeping and what is actually ephemeral and mm -hmm. what is not ephemeral. You know, mm -hmm. so... so ephemerality or, or importance is given not by the object itself, by the perception of the people, what they want to do with that object. So, and, and that's, again, is another strand. I haven't quite discussed it very much in the book because the book was already a bit too long. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, hmm, maybe that is for another project. <laughs> 
Next book. Well, the other thing it reminded me of is there's a section in it where you're talking about cursive. And I think this is really interesting. So I want to dig into that paper really being associated with cursive and people kind of lamenting that like nobody is using Gothic lettering anymore. It's just a shame. <laughs> that reminds me of now when people are lamenting the fact that no one is learning cursive anymore <laughs> is watching that shift again is really interesting. So can you tell us more about the connection between paper and cursive writing? What I thought it was really interesting was to think a little bit more about a term that usually comes up a lot when we talk about the use of paper in books. So this idea that people who wrote on paper were amateur. For me, amateur is not a positive term. <laughs> no, probably it's because I'm not an English native speaker. So you use paper if you're not professional. But then what does it mean professional? So of course, some colleagues would think that in the term of professional scribe. So a scribe that would do that for their job. But when we get to the end of the Middle Ages, this idea of who is a professional scribe is actually a little bit difficult to define because you have all these people in the profession of writing who actually write day in and day out. But they are not professional scribe as in having a shop where you just copy books. And yet they still copy books. <laughs> So I wanted to move away from, again, you know, from this sort of dichotomy between the amateur, the literatum, the gentleman who likes to read and copy books. And I thought, okay, let's just look at the, at the writing. And when I tried to, with a little bit of uh, statistical mind in my head, I thought, okay, let's just see all these books, which sort of scripts do they carry usually? And we know that despite descent between name of scripts and uh, way in which paleographers look at how people wrote in the Middle Ages, there is this broad understanding of the cursive tradition and the more sort of textura set tradition. And it was quite obvious that as I was going through the manuscript that I was interested in or, or the documents that I was interested in, there wasn't so much writing in textura. Occasionally, they would use the title, the, the running title, like we would do now, Time New Romance 16. But there wasn't really much more of that. And I thought, well, but why would they do that? Because probably the cursive script is the script that they learn. That is their script. So if we think about learning different type of scripts, I mean, I don't know you, but when I went to primary school, I had to learn three type of scripts. And we had to practice them out. And the cursive script was just one of them because then we had to learn different type of lettering. And then at the end, I morph into my illegible handwriting <laughs> that nobody can read right now. So, so by looking at that, I thought, okay, so probably the cursive tradition is what is really embedded into the beginning of the learning how to write. And therefore then, it's quite natural that they use it with paper. Although, of course, that doesn't mean that we cannot find it on parchment. So it's not, I also try to stay away from this idea that cursive is paper and set script is parchment. Mm -hmm. But I felt it really interesting that is what is this sort of quick handwriting. Cursive script is the quick handwriting. And I could just see paper fulfilling that sort of urgency you know, I have to send a note to somebody, here it is. And then naturally, it would just be also the material of the books. So for me, again, you know, I was just trying to move away from perhaps some received wisdom and see where can we go. If we did that, what else could we say about the relationship between paper and handwriting? Yeah. And what we're kind of talking about is people who are trained not in a cathedral school and not in a monastic school, but people who are trained as apprentices, perhaps. So the only writing that they need to know is the stuff they can use to write out a receipt yeah. or something like that. So it's a different kind of training. That's what you're saying, right? Yeah. Although uh, I realized that also towards the end of the 15th century, people also train in cathedral schools mm -hmm. and uh, or those that then would end up being the clerk. Right. So the clerks that would work for the bishops, for the king, those clerks also 
had a very quick handwriting, so a cursive handwriting, which in England is called Anglicana. Mm -hmm. And that handwriting is used in parchment and paper as well. Mm -hmm. I do think that that chapter could actually develop in, in a bigger book because I feel that what I've pointed out there probably could do with some more refining. Well, I think it's a really good idea to bring together the idea of training separately. I'm saying bring together, but to think of it separately is training being different from the actual material you're using because you can use your different types of writing on either technology. It's not really yeah. mutually exclusive. And we've yeah, talked absolutely. a lot about books and writing, but there were other uses for paper. We kind of got at this briefly with the salami thing, but paper was used for other things as well. And wrapping is one of them. So I hadn't thought about wrapping paper, <laughs> but people are wrapping stuff in paper. So beyond food, what are they wrapping in paper? Well, the thing is, they don't really tell us because also another problem is that we don't have much evidence of wrapping in general. <laughs> um, from the medieval period because yeah. of course that's a bit that I would check out I think there is some more evidence of that in the later period and Anna Reynolds has been doing some work with that for example you know there are scholars working on it but like for example I found evidence of when they, they would wrap sweets so they would wrap food they would wrap also there was this evidence of a box of books being wrapped with paper before transportation. And I didn't think about why. Why did they wrap a box of books with paper? And I'm wondering whether that's security. So if I put some books in a box and then I wrap it with paper before transportation, if when it arrives, the paper has been lacerated or has got some problems, then probably doesn't mean that somebody has tampered with my book. And of course, this is one of the kings who moved his book from one place to the other in the 15th century. And I'm wondering whether there's some issue of security in that case, rather than protection, because I can't see the box needing paper around it to be protected. Mm -hmm. Or maybe that was the case. But in general, the accounts do not talk to us about what the wrapping was used for. They just say paper for wrapping. Mm -hmm. And I was very surprised to find out that there was more need for paper for wrapping than paper for writing. <laughs> you know, I was just thinking, hang on a minute, surely you want paper for writing. And instead, paper for writing was like a small percentage of the paper that they needed to do other things. So they would make fennels. Yes, I thought that was so interesting because we still use paper to make a quick funnel, yeah. right? <laughs> And then, uh, or to whiten teeth, or, or yeah, or as a plaster, which is what we do, right? Well, the plaster, the paper plaster. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, those are the favorite ones for my children because they don't hurt, mm -hmm. apparently. Uh, <laughs> and yes, so, so there is all of these, all of these examples that come in to effectively perhaps replace or work together with the use of the textile in medicine or in business or, or for transportation. And yet then in the long term, it takes over. But I did need it a lot. Charts, cards and cards of paper being moved from Southampton to Winchester or Salisbury and then to London, which is where the Italian it for a little while had to move out of London and go in other places. Mm -hmm. And you can see that movement. I, I think it's just fascinating. I think so too. And I, one of the things that I hadn't thought about was the little paper sachets that you put the spices in too. Like I can oh, yeah. imagine spices saying to each other, have you tried paper? <laughs> because, <laughs> because it's great when you want to put your, you just funnel a little bit of spice into that and fold it up. Absolutely. Like it's perfect. And I didn't, I, I mean, we've been using paper sachets for things forever, but I hadn't thought about using that back in the Middle Ages or that being a new technology either. Just never yeah. crossed my mind. And also what is also interesting is that they would buy it. They would buy paper with that intention. So they would buy paper to be torn into pieces so that it could be used to store spices. 
And that was done by the Spicer. So, you know, in, a, in the King household um, of King John of France, you know, there was the Spicer who was in charge of that. I, I think the economy and the ecology, because it is an ecology of people with different roles doing different things, is much more richer than what we had imagined. And I certainly, that I imagined before I started this project. It's fascinating. <laughs> We're talking about spicers, but one of the things that maybe you didn't have time to get into in the book was you mentioned that it's used a lot by haberdashers. Oh. Okay, why is it used by haberdashers? That's fascinating. Was it for packing things? Like, we don't know. Okay, we don't know. We need a time machine because now I'm really curious. I'm just thinking maybe if people, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to write this book, well, was because I worked on it for so long that it was time to let it go. Mm -hmm. But then you never know. So there might be people around the world working in archives and coming up with a piece of evidence that, of course, I didn't look at. And then being able to add a little bit of a piece to the jigsaw puzzle. And sometimes the things that we haven't thought about that are the ones that then occasionally jump up and go like, oh, yes. Yes, how does that fit in with what Orieta said? And, and um, this is what is making it all very exciting, actually, because I don't really think my project is the end, but I think it's the beginning of a bigger story that I hope will be taken up by many other people. That's the thing, it's, as you're saying, it's that jigsaw puzzle where we get a closer idea of what it was like every day in a tactile way, <laughs> you know, what is it like to go into the spice or what do you see? And apparently you see little bits of paper. I think that's fascinating. One of the things that you mentioned right near the end of the book is that people could buy choirs. And this is something we talked about with Eric. So people might not, they might know what a choir is. They might not know what a choir is. So maybe we should take a second for that. You could buy ready-made choirs and you can also buy ready-made books, which is something I hadn't realized. You could buy a paper book. So who was buying paper books that were pre-made, like journal style? Who was buying those? What do they need them for? Yeah, yeah. So th that evidence comes actually from the merchants again, because they needed to have that register and that journal. So I I'm assuming they didn't have time. They didn't want to faff about with the folding of the paper, the acquiring of the paper, which means putting one folded sheet of paper into the other to reach a certain amount and then sewing it up in the middle and then we have a nice choir because probably they did not want to deal with any of that they would just buy them ready and they would go straight out to the people who would make them so there is this very famous italian merchant which is called marco dattini that's the name <laughs> so this Italian merchant, Marco Dattini, who decided to build this empire, this commercial empire. And uh, just by luck, all his archive has survived. So we are talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of correspondence and letters that he would send or his companies would send in different branches, you know, this fantastic network of ingenuity, business ingenuity at the end of the 14th century, beginning of the 15th century. And in one of his letters, he writes, I think it's the one where he writes to Florence, to Cartolaio. So Cartolaio is stationary, stationary, to, to a stationary in Florence and said, please send me X number of books in this format with this color, Etc. Etc. Thank you very much. And lo and behold, everything arrived. The interesting thing is that it was like bespoken book production. So they would buy a, a full book, bound and everything, but they would know what that book was. So it needed to be folded in a specific way. It needed to be made with a certain type of paper, and the color of the binding had to be of a certain color. So usually the colors are black, red, white, yellow, sometimes orange. So it is still bespoken, but it's not bespoken as in a finished book with the text in it. It's bespoken as the book. And then I write my stuff in it. And, and we have evidence of that also in England, actually. The guilds would order books. They give us less detail about what the book should entail. And in the university library, we do have a book, complete bound book, 
made of white, just empty. It, it was obviously made with no text. But think about it, we buy these. <laughs> I know. Yeah? I know. I mean, oh, I still buy them. And I buy them in different colors. And then it, it, I write on top here what they should contain. And I'm very fussy about the type of paper and the type of <laughs> book that I buy. Me too. And, you know, if you think about it, it's just natural, isn't it? But now we don't do, I don't go to Fabriano and say, oh, please send me 10 5A books. You know, I, I just go into the stationery down the road or on the internet and I order them. But this sort of idea of writing out single sheets, I think that is still there, of course, at the end of the Middle Ages, but we need probably to distinguish between the practicalities of what paper and book production enable to do, the needs that people had. I mean, yeah. can you imagine all these merchants starting making books before they start in taking down the records <laughs> of, the, of that business? Oh, I mean, I don't think they would pay anybody to do that because I say it's just a waste of money. Mm -hmm. yeah, and also they invented the double recording. So they had to record on one side and then on the other. So what mm. they needed was the tool ready so that they could start writing, not having to mess about with <laughs> making books. Yeah, exactly. If you can buy that pre-made, buy it pre-made. But it is the color coding that really jumped out at me because, yeah, if you have all of these records, how are you going to tell them apart? And color coding is what I do. I think it's what a lot of us do. So just to find, I feel like people haven't changed that much in a few thousand years, but to see evidence of this, you know, I need to color code this so I can keep myself organized. It's just fascinating. It's so interesting. So that alone was enough of a reason to read this book, but it's a fascinating book and I think everyone should read it. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast to talk to us about paper. It was, it was so much fun. Thank you so much for inviting me. As I said before, it's really exciting actually to be there amongst on your website. <laughs> with so many other wonderful people who've been talking to you about what they do. Well, you deserve to be there, and I hope everyone reads your book. To find out more about Orietta's work, you can visit her page at the University of Cambridge at english.cam.ac.uk slash people slash orietta dot da underscore rolled. Her new book is Paper in Medieval England, From Pulp to Fictions. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's new this week, Peter? I guess the news from this week is that medieval horses in England weren't that tall. They just weren't that big. A new study finds that they're about basically the equivalent of like a pony size today. I'm not surprised, to be honest, but you had the grand visions of a knight on a huge charger. Eh, maybe make that horse a little bit smaller here. A battle pony. That sounds awesome to me, man. Hey, so we've got that. you get a nice piece on medieval cryptocurrency. Just the ideas of a cryptocurrency that has kind of even floating back five, six hundred years ago. Wow. Yeah. I'm going to have to read that to learn anything about cryptocurrency. <laughs> I'm going to go backwards. <laughs> I don't know much about today's cryptocurrency. I just kind of wish I got myself a Bitcoin 10 years ago. Like, oh, <laughs> found one on the street. Oh, well. And finally, oh, yeah, Alice Sullivan features a piece on the new digital collection that's from the Monastery of St. Catherine on Mount Sinai in Egypt. So that's one of those like famous monasteries, these back to early Middle Ages. Now you can view its stuff online. And she talks all about that. Wow, that sounds amazing. That sounds really cool. I'm glad that you're posting that. We're getting it up this weekend. So by the time this podcast comes out, that and more will be online. Sounds great. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. Thank you, as always, to our patrons on Patreon.com for all your support. We have amazing stuff for patrons like subscriptions to Medieval Warfare magazine and the Medieval magazine, our book club, and our exclusive maps by Tina Ross. And you also get to feel good about helping Medievalist.net's podcasters to keep bringing you fun historical content, including yours truly. So thank you. For all the details, please visit Patreon.com slash Medievalists. For everything from books to badgers, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalist. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, on social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite online bookstores, where you can even get hold of my latest book, 
How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself a wonderful day. Thank you.